I am absolutely delighted to be here uh, today with Tim Fung, who is the co-founder and the CEO of Airtasker. Um, I think so many of us here on the call today think about the pathway from inception to IPO as um, almost a rarefied dream. Uh, and yet it is the path that Tim has trodden over uh, the years since 2012 um, and is so impressive, not only that he has gone <clears throat> through the long road of you know bootstrapping, getting VC, growing a huge team uh, and becoming one of the most beloved uh, tech products uh, in the country, um, but he has obviously now taken it to the market and become, I think, in the in the uh, in the scheme of things, uh, one of the most well respected and well known faces of technology in Australia. Um, Tim, it's a real pleasure to have you here with us. Thanks for joining. Hey, thanks so much for having me. So, look, I'm sure that um, I'm, I'm guessing that the last couple of months for you have just been endless um, discussion at dinner tables, at coffee shops, and elsewhere about your IPO. But actually. Uh, our interest is really in the early stages of the company and that experience building it and, and what that felt like. And indeed, um, many of the people on the on the call today um, will be, I think, considering going and building businesses. And uh, and you know, all of us would like to draw inspiration from that part of of your story. So let's go. It's it's you know, not not to make any comments about your age, but let's go back. Uh, let's go back a little bit of time. <laughs> to the to the early years um, and even even at your very early years because you know I have read about you uh, in, in in press reports um, that you say that indeed as a young kid you already felt that you had a bit of an entrepreneurial um, spirit that that was something that was demonstrated um, in in your family and then again um, in in the development of a car racing business what was it what was the young Tim Fung getting up to uh, before before he left high school well, I guess, um, you know, in terms of, um, you know, uh, being a student, you know, I grew up, you know, in Sydney, I uh, went to, you know, public schools, I went to my local uh, St. Ives North, and then went to Ataman uh, Public School, and then North Sydney Boys. So I didn't pay too much for my education. So that was, uh, that was a, a bonus. Um, I wouldn't call that entrepreneurial, though. <laughs> um, during that time, I guess, uh, in terms of starting businesses and, and, and thinking about things, I guess, um, I guess something that I um, I think is important um, is being curious about stuff and also just questioning the way stuff works and and thinking about stuff from first principles. Um, you know why are certain things done in in a certain uh, kind of way? Um, in terms of um, you know ways that I managed to you know make a buck uh, during um, you know those early years. Um, well, one of the the, the the earliest memory that I have is. Um, is um, I used to pull out my dad's gray hairs. So he used to pay me a couple of cents to pull out um, you know, gray hairs while he watched uh, TV. Um, and one day I was able to get, um, negotiate the price from, usually I was around two to three cents per gray hair. And it takes about, you know, it takes a good moment of time to be able to do this, um, but two to three cents a hair. But I negotiated one day to 10 cents a hair. Um, and on that day, my dad fell asleep in front of the TV. And so I, um, I pulled out around 20, 250 hairs uh, from my dad's head and um, I got $25, which was, you know, pretty epic as like, I think I was six or seven at the time. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm, you know, I'm the richest person in the world, which is um, fantastic. Um, in terms of other businesses. Um, How did your dad feel? Like, what did he, like on waking up, was he, de was he delighted? Was he like <laughs> young again? $25 for youth. Uh, well, he did question and, and tried to audit the, the hair count because I was just like, look at that pile. That pile is definitely 250. I've counted. Um, and he did resist a little bit for a while, but, but finally uh, gave way um, uh, and, you know, and he paid up. So that was good. Uh, a bit of honesty there. And then, um, yeah, during university, I guess the other met the business that you mentioned was, um, was our circuit club. So um, I, I got into cars when I was about 18 years old, as a lot of, uh, as a lot of young people uh, do. Um, and, you know, it was really, um, uh, we went to the racetrack uh, one time at Wakefield Park down in Goulburn and um, I'm like, this is so awesome. I want to do this all the time, but we can't afford to do it because it you know, costs a couple hundred bucks every time you go. So um, myself and three of my uh, good friends pulled together around 8,000 bucks and we rented out the whole track. Uh, and then we carved that up into tickets and we sold it to, to other people. Um, 
And by doing that on our first event, we only made a $50 loss. Um, and, you know, we were able to drive for free. Uh, so we're like, this is awesome. Let's do this again. Um, we've actually been doing it for the past, um, uh, oh, how long has it been? 15 years or so. Um, and it's, you know, it's expanded into things like we, um, we, we took people to the Nürburgring in Germany and Spa Francorchamps in, in Belgium on, on these um, sort of truck days. But it all started just because we couldn't afford to go ourselves. And, and now with COVID, you're back in Wollongong again, you know, none of, none of the glamour of European racing anymore. Oh, we're definitely, we're, we're definitely, uh, we're definitely Australian focused at the moment. And, and actually it is, it is a bit tough now that we, um, you know, um, all of us, you know, have family and commitments and things like that. So, um, you know, uh, we can't get out to the racetrack as much as we'd like, but, but it's been a great way to solidify our friendship. And like when... So, like, I, I'm hoping that you can um, help people like me who, who who have not at that who at that age did not have an entrepreneurial bone in their body. Like, did you ha did you draw any conclusions doing that that you might want to build businesses? Was that something that was in your mind, or was this just like something that you did and you didn't connect it with an activity or a passion around con like building things? Yeah, I wouldn't say that like business is um, my passion per se. I think it's like solving you know, specific kinds of, of problems. And so it's not that, you know, have a passion for business in the same way that someone would have a passion for, you know, maybe trading stocks or, you know, um, uh, you know, certain kinds of crafts. I think I just enjoy the process of solving a problem um, and that, that comes in lots of different ways. And so, for example, you know, there'd be certain kinds of businesses which I certainly wouldn't be interested in, in, in running or operating or anything like that. Um, and um, yeah, during, during high school and, and even in university, I, don't, I wouldn't say that I was sort of an entrepreneur per se. And it, you know, people always say it's a, it's a kind of funny word to use entrepreneur because um, you know, most entrepreneurs don't think of themselves as entrepreneurs. They just sort of go and start a business and you know, become, a, become a founder. Um, so yeah, I, I tried lots of uh, different things, but it wasn't about business. It was about you know, something that I was passionate about. Yeah. And that... Yeah, it's it, it it it's it's interesting though. Always talking about how what it is that kind of pushed somebody off the perch, right? And you get these people who like have always just like kind of building things, mm. and you get other people who get like really frustrated by something in their industry that they're hearing all the time. And it's it's always it's always interesting to know what it is that like spikes people into into action to want to take on the the pain of building a, <laughs> of building a company over a decade um, and everything that comes with it. Um, anyway, so you obviously didn't have that precise feeling because you did go um, to Macquarie. Uh, like, how how valuable has that been for you in the long? Like, is that something that you like you frequently refer back to in your kind of skill set as as, as being useful, or is it just totally forgotten period of time now? No, I'd say um, I. Um... You know, I definitely didn't sort of plan out a career in this way, but what it ended up eventuating was I sort of started in a in a large organization like Macquarie. I moved from that into a um, an existing small business, which was a modeling, a talent representation agency called Sheik Management. And, you know, that was a smaller business, but it was still a an existing operating business. You know, um, they look after people like Miranda Kerr and a lot of the Victoria's Secret models and things like that. And, you know, so they have turnover had staff around 30 people and I, I walked into that and worked in, in that environment for a while. I then worked in a, um, off the back of that relationship, um, worked on a company called Amazon, which is like a mobile uh, SIM card uh, startup, which we started out the back of the modeling agency. And that, I guess, was a chance to um, get even closer to the center of, you know, what goes on in, in a company. And, and that was incredibly eye-opening to learn that, oh, wow, you can like raise money for stuff like I didn't even know that this was a thing that you know people would give you money before you'd you know actually gone out and, and started a business mm. um, and then from there I'm um, going out and doing it uh, on, on my own um, and I think you know in hindsight that was a good that was a good journey I think I learned uh, things at each step of that way and particularly at Macquarie one thing that I've, I've discovered especially as we've scaled um, at Airtasker is um, it is a phenomenal culture. It is a bank uh, for sure. Like, and it, you know, there's lots of stuff not to like about it. Um, but one thing is they definitely have a culture. There's, you know, very precise and principled ways that they like to do things at Macquarie. One of those things is being very sort of entrepreneurial and, and business driven. Um, then on top of that, you've just got really high caliber people in, in many of the roles at, at Macquarie and they, they hold those high standards. And I think 
uh, that has been something that's really helped along the way. Um, and I know like a lot of founders, you know, kind of come out of uni at, you know, age 20 or 19, or, you know, maybe even just, you know, out of high school um, and, and start a business. Um, I think that's, you know, that's epic if, if that's your path, but if, if that's not your path, I would generally say like, you know, starting in the bigger companies and sort of working your way down is, is um, definitely taught me something. Mm. I mean, look, to, 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 you know, jumping forward, just because I think it is a really interesting um, comment, this idea of building a company culture, like, was that something that was in your mind early? Or, or is it something that as you've gotten big, you've, you're like, fuck, I, you know, we really need to have a kind of a really clear understanding of who our people are and what we stand for. And, and that, that kind of like, was an evolution over time. Yeah, it's mostly been an evolution over time. And, and, I would say that in some ways it's fairly reactive. You know, I, I think it's rare that somebody sort of sits on a mountaintop and says, here's what's important to me in my life, you know, the seven pillars of excellence or something, and then, and then pronounces those to a team and is passionate about driving them through. Um, you know, obviously, as you get more experienced over time, I think you do learn those things. And I, I'm sure if I, you know, were to start another company now, I would have much stronger views on what good is and what, what not good is. Um, but but when we started Airtask, it was just go, go, go. And when things broke, we'd go and fix them. So we'd be like, oh my gosh, like this part of our company is really uh, frustrating. We need to go and, and fix this. And over time, we've consolidated that into principles and values and norms that, you know, are now sort of articulated, um, you know, in written form and things. But I think one thing that, that can happen is those things are definitely important. You will not reach excellence without having those sorts of things. Um, on the other hand, it's also the case that they're probably not the first things that you want to address. Um, they're, they're sort of, in my view, a bit of a Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Like the first thing that you want to have in a company is an idea and some flow of, of sales and revenue. And, and um, on top of that, then you probably, the next layer up is you want to be growing, you know, on top of just having something that works, it needs to be working and, and, and getting better. Um, then on top of that, you know, you need to have a great team and organization around that to keep that going. And, you know, probably higher up in the uh, hierarchy of needs are some of those more uh, self-actualization things like um, values and principles and all that. And I think one of the biases that we have is that you only really hear advice from people who have been successful. You know, you hear from the founders of Atlassian or the founders of Canva. And so they'll they're obviously in the mindset of talking about things like values and principles because they've gone on that journey. You know, the first thing they did is they had a company, they had some great people in that, and then they got to that level. Um, and because they're espousing to people what, you know, they think is important, it is true in their context, it's important. But I would say if you're starting a fish and chip shop or something like that, the first thing you want to do is have some good fish and chips before you worry about your values and your, your principles and articulating them in, in that kind of way. Yeah, I like, or like, you know, I've, I've, you know, founded a couple of different companies and, and my experience always in that early period is that literally everything is on fire, right? I mean, yeah. you're surrounded by fire. Uh, there isn't roles, there isn't culture, there is just, you know, panic, really. Um, how, um, how, how did you... Like and and you and you kind of got to pick your way out of it, right? And 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 that's 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 actually got to be kind of comfortable with it. Like, is that what it felt like for you initially, or did you did you kind of have an, a sense of control um, as as you as you started going? Like, how how did you handle that? Well, I would say the problem with us was even worse than, than having a fire. <laughs> I would say what we had was more equivalent to you know to you know flint rocks and some sticks and we sort of looked around and we're like, I'd really love it if there was a fire, you know, in some sense, having a fire burning, you know, is, is something to go do to, to react to. And, and, you know, starting a two-sided marketplace was very much more like, yeah, you're in an empty forest and you're like, I'd really wish there was a fire to put out. Um, who's going to start a fire? How can we get this going? And um, so, and that, that actually is even more difficult. It creates that ambiguity where, you're, you don't know each day whether you're actually focusing on the right thing or the wrong thing, and, and you're looking for that uh, thing to go and execute on. Um, so the first couple of years for us were really, really challenging, where you know every week we would wonder whether this was the right thing to be working on. Mm. Um, but you spoke before, I guess one of the, the analogy to the fire that we did have is that we did raise around about $1.4 million very early on. We were able to do that because we'd come from a Mason and so we had a bit of a track record with investors, et cetera. 
Mm. Um, but that certainly did create that pressure. Of, was, okay, we jumped off the cliff, figure out how to, you know, um, not die. How, um, just like I, I wanted, I, I did actually want to come back to that because I think this is really quite an important um, point. Like, where were you? Like, because a lot of, you know, you imagine you, you, a lot of people probably on this call are, are in that moment where they're considering building a company or they've just resigned and they're thinking about that path to the first check and like when it comes in the evolution of the business. Like, where was that? for you and how big a, I mean, $1.4 million pre-revenue is, 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 a, is even, even in today's language, a big achievement. Mm. Um, when did that come and what was the, what was the impact? So um, I think it depends a lot on the kind of business that you're building and, um, and each kind of business, I think will have a slightly different capital curve, um, particularly in, in marketplaces or, or, or social products like what, um, what Airtasker is. There's definitely this idea that you want to be raising up front because you're effectively building out a piece of infrastructure. You're building out a network, and that network might have much value until you know later down the track. On the other hand, once you have that network, it's really valuable, and so you know you want to get there. But how do you stage your way uh, towards getting there? Um, and I would say you know a marketplace is probably one less than a social network. You know, a social network would be like the most extreme version. You know, build for five, ten years monetize later. Marketplaces aren't too dissimilar from that, but thankfully, you know, we generate revenue along that curve, mm. um, but it's certainly not proportional. You know, that first, um, that first iteration, we had to build all of the software for one task. You know, at least when you do the second task, you know, you're splitting it over two tasks and, 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 and it goes on, but you had to spend up front. So that, that's why we raised so early on. Um, mm. However, I would say that, you know, the extreme other end of that might be more like a services business, you know, where you're an accountant or a lawyer and you're going to, you know, sell consulting services. I would say you almost don't need to raise any money for that or, or very minimal, you know, enough to cover an office and maybe the first month of marketing or something, but you would have a very different capital curve. Mm. Um, and so I think it's really just dependent um, on, on, on what, you're, um, what you're building as to how you think about uh, that. But we knew for sure that we wouldn't get anywhere without raising some decent capital. And, and look, I'm going to guess back in 2012 that, um, you know, that was done on 2012's version of a safe, which is a convertible note. Um, how, how did you, like, when you were thinking about, oh, we've got to get money together, like talk, it'd be really interesting, talk people through, obviously you were like, hey, let's turn around and go to the amazing guys. But like, what was that moment? Like, how did you construct your fundraising in those, in that early period? Well, I would say that back in 2012, it was a completely different environment. You didn't have the sophistication that, that you have now. And you certainly, you know, um, it was actually quite a, quite a um, pivotal year in terms of the Australian ecosystem, because it was that year that literally Blackbird, SquarePeg, Airtree, all of those companies sort of um, uh, came about. Um, so none of that was uh, there back in, back in those days. So we took quite an unconventional uh, path where we actually raised ordinary equity. Um, and, and pretty much followed that all the way through. Um, there are pros and cons of doing this, I would say. Uh, one of the pros of ordinary equity is it's very easy to sell um, because you, um, you're talking to your investors and you're like, you're getting exactly what I'm getting. And um, it's very simple. You know, you get 10% of the company. If I make $10, you make $1, that, that, that's it. Um, and it actually did, does keep things really simple, especially when, uh, you know, crap hits the fan. Um, for example, um, you know, if the company um, does a down round by 20%, everyone is looking at each other around the table going, yeah, we're all going to suffer 20% because we're doing a down round at 20%. Um, and so it has a lot of advantages in that sense. Um, on the flip side of that, I would say that we probably took some early dilution that um, if we had had, you know, structured equity um, or hybrid equity, like a convertible node or a safe node or, or even preference equity or something like that, um, you know, we probably could have raised at a much higher valuation and suffered less dilution from that. Mm -hmm. um, the downsides of doing that is, is a couple of fold. One is that, you know, if the first person comes in and does preference equity, the second person who comes in almost always says, I want that and a bit more. And, the, you know, by the time you're in a series D or something, um, you're pretty, you know, it, it's not too dissimilar from having debt, you know, um, in the company. Now, if that doesn't work out, if that works out really well, and you know, you, you hear about Facebook and um, you know, 
um, in Australia, Canva and people like this, it works out so well because you're just charging, bang, 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 and it ne none of those um, conditions ever sort of play out. Um, if you have a bit of a rocky path though, which you know I'd say the vast majority of companies do, um, those um, structured equity things can come back and be pretty difficult to, to deal with. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you've got, yeah, if you've got a big preference stack. The other thing is, I think it just makes some of the conversations and things more complex because, you know, when you're around in that boardroom, one board director might be holding uh, preference equity, another one's holding uh, ordinary equity. And of course, you're not going to be 100% aligned on, on, on what you want. So, um, look, I think, um, I think you just got to sort of assess those pros and, and, and cons um, and, you know, make a choice on which direction you want to go. Did, did you do any, I mean, I mean, you, you, you had the good fortune of coming out of Macquarie. So perhaps you were, you know, pretty literate about this stuff already, but do, what did you do to bone up on, on mate before you started embarking on fundraising? Was it anything or was it a learn as you go experience? Well, I would say that, um, you know, um, Jeff Bezos often talks about one way doors versus two way doors. Um, one way doors essentially being, you know, irreversible decisions versus two way doors, which is, you know, give it a crack. It doesn't work. Try it again. Mm. Um, and I would say that sticking to ordinary equity is, um, is a pretty two-way door because you can always move to preference equity um, and, and, and start going down that track of more complicated, um, you know, financial structuring and stuff. Um, whereas if you're with ordinary equity, it's, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty simple. Um, and so I would say that, you know, it's, it's probably advisable in that, that very early period, you stick to something pretty vanilla um, and then, you know, um, structure things as, as, as you get confident that that's the direction that you want to go in. But it is, in a sense, a, a one-way door. Once you go down that preference equity route, you're probably going to be layering up from there. Mm. Um, Tim, there's a question that's come in from Shelley, which is kind of a general question, um, asking, you know, what was the most, in this early period, what was the most kind of critical early stage problem you had to deal with? And, and how did you then, um, you know, answer it or respond to it? Yeah, I would say, um, so one of the tricky things for us, you know, primarily I would say that um, depending on what stage you're at in your startup, you're going to be judged on different metrics and different, you know, signs of, of success. Um, and one of the hard things for us early on was sort of one, defining what success is, and then two, you know, going out and achieving it. So um, what we kind of realized is early on in, in any kind of marketplace or social product, you really want to start at the top of the funnel. Um, so, you know, literally in our first investor pitch, I think we, we, we told people, hey, we have this much, um, you know, uh, page views on Airtask, you know, like people are, are thinking we're interesting. And then in, in a couple of weeks time, we moved down to like registered users. And then over time, we moved to posted tasks. And now where we're at, people are asking about revenue and margins and things like that. But one of the hardest things is to sort of define that narrative of what success looks like. Um, and it's different for different companies. Um, I think now there's a lot of sort of wisdom that's out there around SaaS companies. And so there are a lot of good benchmarks uh, for that. But our, um, the problem with marketplaces is that that benchmarking doesn't really exist. No one really knows what good looks like in those early stages. Um, to be a little bit more direct in answering the question, I'd say the hardest part for us was um, really driving demand uh, into our marketplace. We've got a pretty rock star proposition to our taskers, which is, you know, turn up to Airtasker, there's free access to flexible work. That, that's a pretty rock star um, uh, proposition. So for us, it was all about sales on the demand side. That's, so that's really interesting. And just you know, to, to put that in context, right? So when you're building a marketplace, what you wanna have is a rough balance between supply and demand that keeps the supply uh, and the demand sides happy. And so you, I, I'm just let's take that a step back. What you were saying is, you know, actually it was relative, the supply side, one, one of these sides always comes a little easier, right? In any kind of marketplace model, you're saying, hey, we gave gig economy workers an opportunity to kind of get to, to get work quickly. So that was relatively easy. So then you were noodling about, okay, well, how do we get demand on? What, how, how did you make a decision around the way to acquire them? The way to acquire demand? Mm. Um, I would say that, uh, you know, we, a lot of this was done on gut instinct um, and it tells us now, you know, looking back on it, I think we were fortunate that the group of people that we had who started the company did have a pretty good gut instinct for what to try, but we effectively tried a lot of stuff and then, you know, saw what stuck. Um, again, I think if you were, 
you know, I think there's a lot more wisdom out there um, and a lot more literature, et cetera, out there now that, you know, that doesn't need to be the case that you start from absolute scratch. I think people can be a lot more educated, but well, certainly where we were uh, back in 2012 is that that didn't really exist, not for marketplaces anyway. Um, mm -hmm. And so we, we just tried a lot of stuff based on gut instinct. Um, recalling some of the things that we tried, uh, we did PR. Um, that was um, something we did a lot. We did content marketing, although we didn't call it that. We just sort of, you know, were blogging and chucking stuff on social and stuff like that. We paid up for Google AdWords uh, early on, but only to a very thin layer. Mm. Um, uh, and, and we just tried a lot of those different things. And, and now what we've discovered is that as we're growing and scaling and trying to invest uh, further capital into these initiatives, we're effectively productionizing a lot of the successful bets that we made in the early days on gut instinct. We're kind of taking those gut instinct random ideas that people had in the shower and just you know acted on and turning that into systemized productionized um growth channels but but fun and I, what i'm getting from what you're saying is that like fundamentally the skill set isn't that different it's just that now you have you know slightly more resources uh and and a higher sophistication but it's still a kind of a test and learn methodology that you're using even at this stage in the company oh yeah i think um i think um you know we, we we've we've sort of swung on a pendulum um, and, and you find, uh, I think that as you go through building business, you know, you often sort of notice something and you course correct it and you over index for it and you got to bring it back, um, back and forth. And I think um, we, you know, obviously in the early stages of the company, it's very sort of, you know, it's almost like a dictatorship. It's like, Hey, let's just do this. You know, it's not a dictatorship in terms of like, um, you know, uh, forcing people to do stuff, but it's one person making a decision. Let's just yeah. go and do this and let's go. Um, as you grow, um, you can find that sometimes um, uh, accountability sort of dissipates and, you know, things start getting spread across more people and there's more just sort of like groupthink uh, going on. Um, and so more recently, we've been indexing uh, even more so, you know, back to some of that entrepreneurial and decision making um, type stuff where we want product managers to say, you know what, I believe this to be true and I'm going to have a crack at it. I don't need to do you know, weeks and weeks of research to prove this. I'd rather make it a small bet, take a crack at it and find out if it works, if it doesn't. Um, and everything else, frankly, is conjecture. Mm. Okay, so um, you've raised one and a half, you've raised, you know, one, 1. 1.4 mil. Um, you've gotten going, you've had some kind of demand side difficulties, uh, I'm guessing in your first kind of 18 months. At what point did you have a sensation of, okay, we're gonna have to raise more money um, this is what we're going to like for us to be able to get more cash in. This is what we're going to need to to do. Like when when did you when did you have a kind of a clear vision of what it would take to kind of close that next round? It's funny. Every time um, we thought that we were starting early, so you know um, you know and it, it, it's all relative, right? Like right now, um, you know, as a listed company, we've got an infinite runway and infinite you know um, a cash burn runway, etc. But uh, certainly in those early stages, um, you know, I thought six months was plenty. You know, I oh, was down to six months of cash. I got, you know, four months to close this. This will be no problem and we'll do it with eight weeks of notice. Um, what all, almost always happened is that we'd be around four weeks from, from you know, complete disaster every time we ended up closing around. Um, and I think this is another thing that, you know, um, that um, a lot of founders, you know, um, what makes a successful founder is that, you know, you have to be okay with that level of ambiguity. Um, and, it, and it kind of, um, it's pretty stressful. It's anxiety, it creates a lot of anxiety, right? You're kind of like, well, I don't know where I'm going to be exactly in six months. Um, for me, I was kind of forced into it because after we'd raised the $1.4 million, I was kind of like, okay, I just have to live in this ambiguity for the next uh, few years. But um, I do think that it's worthwhile kind of um, enjoying that to some extent. I wouldn't say you'll ever get comfortable with it. Um, but you have to, you know, enjoy the, the journey that you're going on. And, and that journey will be full of tons of ambiguity, et cetera. And actually, I think a mistake that people can make is, is trying to shut down that ambiguity too much. You know, it's human nature to not want to have, you know, to, to, to have certainty what the future is. But you probably should expect that that future is not certain anyway. So even if you are thinking, you know, um, I can, you know, lock down a certain amount of money and I'll be set for the rest of my life or whatever. 
Um, nothing is, is, is certain. And so being able to live and deal with a bit of that ambiguity is probably something that you want to get comfortable with if you're going to go on this journey. Yeah, I mean, on the, you know, on the on the personal side, right? Like, how, how because as you kind of say, like, it's not you 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 raise money, and then all of a sudden you're like, oh, like I'm responsible for these investors' money until this finishes, and and suddenly you have, as you say, like, it's like you ca- you carry that burden, and 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 there is a like it's a different feeling of. Um, anxiety than what you experience say in a corporate right it's like it's, it's like it literally feels different physiologically um like what what like what did you learn to do is it like exercise is being with friends? like how did you kind of learn to cope with that early on yeah it's like compartmentalizing to some extent you know to the extent possible is 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 a um is a good tip um i would say you know, I work, uh, we always worked in an office, you know, in a physical space. I, I'd imagine if you were remote working, that would be really tough uh, from a mental um, health position. You know, if your laptop is in front of you 24 seven, you know, um, that would be pretty tough. So I think compartmentalizing a physical space is, is uh, potentially a good idea there. It certainly worked uh, for me. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I do, I do do some sports which kind of force compartmentalization. So like doing rice, um, rock climbing, um, uh, driving cars and things like that. And, and generally those things force you out of your, um, you know, thinking about the business uh, mindset. Uh, but I would say that, um, you know, starting a company is definitely, it, it, it goes all the way into your, into your life. And, it, and, and it's pretty tough, you know, if on, a, on a Sunday afternoon, even when you're with your family or with your, you know, your, um, kids or your dog or whatever, um, you know, whatever you do, um, you do find yourself wandering back into business um, mode. And I think that, um, you know, that's something that you probably should accept. And, and um, rather than, you know, um, trying to, you know, pretend it ain't true, um, sort of roll with it. And, and, and if you've got a partner or people who are around you, um, be honest with them about that. I found that um, with my, uh, with my wife who, um, is I talk a lot about Airtasker with her and actually like engage her in that rather than, you know, pretending that I'm not uh, thinking about it. And that's been uh, really good for us. Mm. Okay. So um, a couple of years go by, you've got, um, you know, 300,000 active users, 30 employees, 20 million worth of jobs going through the platform and you raise eight and a half million dollars. Um, that, that, that like that's an amazing achievement in a in a in a few years. Like what what, what like if you if you look back and you say, hey, there were the there must have been a couple of points in those first few years where there were real inflections. Where and and I'm guessing also you know in your head you're like, oh, we learned a whole heap. Like and this is what we did. Can can you remember any of them at this stage? I think that's a really great point because uh, when I look back on, you know, what our growth charts look like, I, I, I basically can remember, you know, our growth figures down to the day or the week, you know, because I, I remember that little bump. Um, and uh, well, one of the interesting things, and, and we're observing this uh, today at Airtask as well, is um, when you're on the start of an S-curve or on the start of a, you know, something special um, that, is, that is about to go, um, I don't think you know. And, and I reflect back on it now. I don't think at any point back in the days of Airtasker, you know, we'd look at this curve and it looks like this now, but there was no one day where we came in and we're like, hey guys, we've, uh, we've done it. We're on the curve. Let's, let's, let's go get some champagne and enjoy the day. Um, and yet when we look back, we're like, oh, the summation of all of those days and weeks of hard work did add up to a curve, which would imply that, that, you know, that at some point you should have realized. Um, and um, it's kind of funny because, you know, at Airtasker now, we're, we've just launched a, um, a new product called Airtasker Listings, which is, you know, one of our biggest ever product launches. It's basically, um, you know, taking Airtasker where you post a task and, and actually flipping it around and saying to the taskers, now you can um, create packages of services that you want to offer to our, our customers. So it's sort of reverse Airtasker in some sense. Um, and um, I was sitting down with the team and they're like, yeah, we've grown um, 100% week on week for the past uh, three weeks. And, um, and literally the numbers kind of like bang, bang, bang. And I was just kind of like, hey, so uh, I think you're onto something pretty special. They're, they're all sitting there going, no, we've got to work on this next part of the product. We've got to ship this. We've got to, you know, and I was like, 
I think you're on an escape, guys. Like this is pretty, uh, pretty exciting stuff. Um, my point there is, you know, you only know it's an S curve when you're looking back in and in. Um, when you're on it, it just feels like a fire, as you mentioned. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But 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 surely, I mean, so you raise eight and a half million in uh, in in 2015, and then 2016 you raised 22. So surely that was some external validation that indeed, you know, stuff was starting to go. How how did that how did that feel? Was it was it a sense of just like everything creaking at the seams to 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 accommodate the growth? Yeah, I would say um, I would say for us, um, no, we we're always chasing growth. So um, it wasn't. We never got in as a marketplace business like our. One of our major jobs is to drive growth in in job opportunities for our taskers, and so we we actually don't actually have much of an operational uh, kind of business, you know. So I know that in some companies, for example, um, let's say you make shoes, you know, um, uh, as a business, you might get a situation where customers are, you know, a thousand customer orders are coming in a day, and you just can't make shoes fast enough. Um, but at Airtasker, our job, in some sense, almost literally, is growth and uh, creating more job opportunities for our taskers. So we were uh, definitely, you know, never in that position where we're just sitting back and, you know, trying to uh, solve operational stuff. Um, I would agree with you about those milestones. Like we definitely, you know, we, um, you know, we raised um, around $22 million in 2016. That was definitely memorable and around 35 in, in 2017. And they were certainly milestones. Um, if I if there was anything that I wanted to reflect on on that though is that I kind of suck at celebrating and so I um and I actually I, I don't say that in a sort of humble brag kind of you know I'm a hard worker kind of way I actually kind of suck at it um and so more recently I've realized that it's really important to celebrate these milestones because um, other people who are on the journey around you they need to you know be given indicators that things are progressing in the right way and that when success comes around, we actually do enjoy it. Um, that is like super critical um, to most people. And so I think we did a good job of celebrating the IPO. Um, you know, we, we basically, you know, gave the team the, the whole day off. Um, and then we had, a, we had an epic uh, party on a boat with another startup, which was, uh, which was really, really awesome. And we really did celebrate and stop and smell the roses. But the main reason for that is because I was like, if you don't smell the roses in an IPO, when are you gonna smell the roses? Like that's pretty much, that's pretty much the the you know um, the milestone. The smell the roses moment, right? Like that's yeah, right. Um, how, like okay, so you know, I, I've there, there's there's a lot of questions. So I just I do want to just dwell. I like it, 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 that's an interesting introduction because what I, what I did want to say is you know what was that moment like? You know, there there must have been a set of like a fair amount of kind of catharsis or whatever at that moment ringing the bell like did it feel like the culmination like did it feel like what you had hoped for dreamed for all the way along when you were doing it or were you just kind of like oh shit now we've got to do our earnings call you know like what did it feel like um i would say that um that you know it was in danger of of just being like hey let's just roll through this and get to the next thing um other than the fact that um my chairperson actually pulled me up and said you better celebrate this thing because like these things don't happen uh, too often. And so um, a couple of weeks out from the IPO, you know, I really took it on as a challenge to make sure that, you know, I enjoyed the day, but also the whole team that contributed to, to building this company enjoyed that day too. Um, and so, you know, there, there was a bit of a mix, but we definitely did enjoy the day. And, and I actually had my mum come and uh, ring the bell. Um, so my mum, um, made it to the front cover of the AFR, which was my, uh, which was a personal goal of mine. Um, so we managed to get her in that shot, and you know she rang the bell with me and and, and our chairperson James. That's that, that's that's really uh, that's that's really awesome, man. I'm I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm glad you got to go through that. Okay, I'm gonna there's there's a whole bunch of questions uh, in the Q and A, and I'm gonna uh, give an opportunity to run through some of these. They're gonna go over some of the stuff that we did um, um, previously, but. You'll see the kind of the nature of what people are interested to hear. Um, it it one one person's asking. Um, Jessica says, you know, it can be really hard to explain something that hasn't existed before. Um, how did you how did you grapple with that? And in in terms of explaining the concept of air tasker to people around you, and 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 how was it received? I love this question. Um, 
So thanks, Jessica, for that question. I actually um, logged on this um, with my team uh, recently because it, it, um, it is something that actually, um, uh, it, is, it is even more so true for Airtasker, I believe, than, than a lot of other companies. So um, one of the things about Airtasker is we believe in this long tail of services, right? That, um, you know, if I look at the data now, you can see that people use Airtasker for all these kinds of services, which, you know, don't really exist outside of Airtasker. So it might be, you know, uh, removing a spider from your home, or it might be like, setting up some children's play equipment and all of these things. And one of the things that um, we've realized about Airtasker is that the aggregation of all of those customer problems is actually absolutely massive. Like, although we laugh at any one individual problem and go, oh, well, that's not a business in its own right. The summation of all this stuff is, is, is huge. And I imagine it's similar to like YouTube. You know, you start up a company like YouTube, you can't imagine that like, um, all the different kinds of videos that could be on YouTube, but you just kind of have this feeling, people love videos. I think that if we create this, it'll, it'll be good. And that's how we felt about Airtask, but it is really hard. It's really frustrating to tell people like this long tail of services, we believe this is gonna happen. And people will be like, eh, I, don't think, I don't think spider removal is a big enough business to, you know, to warrant a VC check for, um, et cetera. Um, so it was really, really tough. You do feel like you're beating your head against the wall. And what I would say there is, um, it's great if you can find investors that really believe in your story um, and, and get those real believers on because we certainly had a, you know, a number of investors that we probably like tried to convince to get on, our, on, our, um, on the journey and we were just never gonna get there because they didn't have that core belief. Uh, so try and find those people who really are you know, behind what you're doing at that, that fundamental level. Mm. Um, similarly, like, um how did you how did you get on your like initial and early team members um you know beyond you and jonathan like what was the composition of the team and, and more importantly like you know how how did that those first conversations unfold yeah i would say actually this is something that i've learned a lot from um over over 10 years of running this business and i i don't think that i did it particularly well i would actually say that if there's one thing that you do want to do at that um, at that really sort of um, high performance level early on in a company, it's hiring. Um, I do think that it is worthwhile, you know, structuring rubrics, for example, to say, here is what I think the right person in this role looks like. You know, I need someone who's scrappy. I need someone who is happy to work on Saturdays. I need someone who, you know, um, is, is a great content writer and can write this kind of content, like being really specific about that. And then actually investing a lot of your time into doing that. So I would say that, you know, I knew Jono from uni, so it was, it was great. We already had a relationship and we knew that we would work really well together in those, um, those early days, um, but we did not invest enough into um, creating that talent acquisition function early. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my, my, my thoughts on this is, you know, probably employee number 10 or so should probably be that person who does the talent spotting. It's, I think it's that important. Uh, to get that early and I've seen a number of companies who you know it might have been like second time or third time around founders who do do that early and uh, I think it does pay dividends yeah that's uh, like a bit of, and also like just the the sheer complexity of convincing people when you've got like no money and nothing really to show and and yet to be able to get top talent I think is a real indicator of, a, of a, you know good founders right absolutely so yeah I would, I would invest a lot into getting that um, that proposition right early on and, and the process right. And I'd probably just pay up, um, frankly, to, to get the right um, talent that you need. And, and that's probably equity uh, early on, but I think um, those early team members will make a huge difference in, in, in what you do. Yeah, the, the, like if you make right choices, the, the, the long-term payoff for enterprise value for giving away a little extra equity is, I think, is, is a no brainer, right? When you, when you extrapolate it. Um, Amy asks, um, you, you know, you chose to work with different or a range of different early stage investors um, at each different um, financing round. Why, why did you, what was the basis for doing that? Was that part of a broader strategy? Like, how did you select them? Um, so I would generally say that you know, again, it's a hierarchy of needs thing, which is that, you know, in the first instance, you need the money. And then within that, um, you would, you're probably doing some selection. 
Um, well, at least that was the case for Airtasker because we did have a capitally intensive business model um, from the from the beginning. Um, so um, I would say what ended up uh, being the case that really worked for us is is working with um, with those real believers and other founders uh, in the um, who had had previous success and so wanted to go on another journey and believed in the Airtasker story. Um, so I think what was um, really important is we we um, did some pretty sweet deals for um, to get on some early angel investors um, and make sure that we closed them because they were sort of fundamental to building up momentum and then uh, going after other uh, investors. But I would say it's a pretty luxury problem to be choosing uh, who your investors uh, are at each step. And, you know, you often hear about that, but I think that's mainly a sort of a success biasing issue where you only really hear about people um, who have been incredibly successful in raising money. You know, if you're Airbnb, of course you're saying, oh, well, yeah, I had to choose between Andreessen Horowitz and, you know, Kleiner Perkins. And of course I wanted, you know, Meg Whitman to be on my board. So I went with Kleiner Perkins, you know. Um, I think that that is not usually the case. I think it's usually get the necessary money in and then, you know, you might be making some choices within that, um, but certainly we didn't have that luxury. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's it actually is one of the Q and A questions. Somebody somebody says, you know, do you think the process would have been different if you had not secured that first investment? And obviously, it's a counterfactual. But like, what do you think it would have looked like? Do, do, would that have been existential, or like, what do you think would have happened? Um, I think it would have been fairly existential. Yeah. Um, I, actually, one point four million dollars sounds like a truckload of money, uh, but I can tell you. It goes into your bank account. You're like, okay, that's cool. I've never seen $1.4 million that I could you know, kind of check with myself. Um, but then you start looking at your burn rate. And I remember one of our burn rates in the first four months, in one month, I think two of our Google bills fell into one month and two of our rent bills fell into one month. And the burn was like 150K or something. And I literally flipped it. I was like, holy shit. <laughs> like, this is hectic. Like, we have a total of 1.4 million. We've literally burnt 10% of that in a month. And we have no revenue to show for this. Uh, it's it's pretty um, it's uh, pretty scary stuff. Yeah, I was talking with a founder the other day, you know, and they you know they've just had, had they did a, a you know nine million dollar round about you know a bit over twelve months ago, and and he's like, you know, this is like point at which you officially get to halfway through, and like before you get to halfway through the burn, you're like, this is great, we're fine, we've got heaps of time, and you get to that halfway point, and all of a sudden oh, yeah. you're like, oh my god, we're running out of money, like what are we? <laughs> Um, 40% probably feels a lot like 20% or 10%. Yeah, exactly. Um, hey, how did you, um, Shelly asks um, how, you, how you balance wearing all the hats of the business when you start, right? I mean, at the beginning, it's you, it's, it's Jonathan, like you basically do every function in the business. How did you manage that? How did you um, spread those tasks out? Like what, what was your kind of management philosophy at that point in time? Well, it was actually really good. I guess, again, just reflecting on the fact that, you know, one of the luxuries that we had uh, was that Jono and I knew each other for quite a few years. We actually went to uni together and then we had a lot of common friends and then we went to, um, to do a Mason. So, um, you know, he was part of that early journey. And so it was a fairly clear cut, which was that, you know, I was good at the business, the marketing, uh, raising money and the finance side of things. And, and Jono was really good at the um, product management side of things, um, operating the, the software, um, ops, all of those kinds of things. And so roughly that's how we, we cut it up um, in, the, um, in the early days. Um, I think it does come with, you know, there's definitely, like I, I really enjoyed the parts that I did. I think overarchingly, Jono really enjoyed the parts that, that he did and, and that's where his strength was. Um, but there's definitely tensions in how you split all of that stuff up um, in the in the early uh, days. And, you know, that's just something that you've got to navigate with. And unfortunately, we had a really good relationship from, you know, many years before that, that we were able to do that. Um, in terms of like individual priorities, I think once you've sort of split out where the responsibilities are, one of the things that I find these days is it's good to kind of have a linear sort of list of to-dos, uh, but it's also good to just dump your mind onto a piece of paper uh, every now and then. And I actually do use a pen and, and paper to do that. Is just to go, what are those big bubbles of, um, areas that, that are that are the fires that are burning or the priorities that I've got um, and just to be able to visualize that and take it out of your head because I think a lot of anxiety and a lot of um, you know pressure can come from the fact that you've got all these things in your head um, and they're all sort of disparate and not connected 
um, and that can just you know cause a lot of um, can cause a lot of stress. So I think it's good to get that down on a on a piece of paper so that you can identify which are the things that that are most important to solve. And and do you have any like um like you know personal management techniques that you do for that? Like, do you say, oh look, every three months I take a I take two days off. You know, I go up to the Blue Mountains and I stare out at the woods and I you know do this or, or any of that sort of stuff. So one is, I think, um, I do have a business coach uh, who sort of, you know, acts as a therapist in some way. Um, and and I, I don't mean that too jokingly, like as in someone who you can just talk to and dump a lot of the pressure onto yep. and who can set you straight. Yeah. Um, so I think that's one thing that I did invest into. I appreciate that's something that, you know, um, you probably got to get to a certain business scale to be able to afford that. But I think in the absence of that, um, probably, you know, a mentor or, or someone like that, um, would be would be really valuable uh, to have. Um, I also do one thing on Sunday night, which is, you know, I'm, I'm the one person in the company who doesn't really have a manager other than, you know, the board. Um, and so whilst um, we encourage each of our team members to write an update email to their manager, um, I do it the reverse way, which is I send an email out to all of my reports and, um, and just talk through like, what did I do this week? What am I planning to do next week? what are the big roadblocks and challenges in front of me on what else? Um, and I send that every Sunday night at 7 p.m. to my team. And that's a little bit of structure and I think gives you that accountability in the absence of having, you know, a manager uh, per se. Um, lastly, I would just say, you know, try and enjoy your weekends if you can. Um, that's been harder and harder for me. But, you know, I think try to carve, um, you know, some full days out of work is, is powerful. It is a luxury, I think, you know, those early days of a startup, I think you do, you know, there is a bit of a just grind it out uh, kind of concept, but um, as you grow, you probably want to get um, more focused on, on making um, a small number of really good decisions as opposed to just, you know, running on the, on the treadmill. So I do try to uh, take some time out on the weekends. Mm, that's a really, that's a really interesting. Event. And not feel guilty about it. I think that's the other thing. Like, you know, if you're a runner and you are literally running every day, all day, surely that's not very good for winning races. Um, I think it's the same thing with your brain. You know, if you want to make good decisions and, and, and succeed, you probably want to give your brain a rest just like you give your body a rest. So don't feel guilty about it. It's, it's doing a service to the company. I think that's probably um, very good advice to everybody, um, everybody on the call. Um, one you know, one one last question uh, for you from the from the crowd. You know, I mean, with with experience and and hindsight, like you know, again, going back to the earlier stages, what 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 is what is it that people need to look out for? Where, where, what is it that trips you up in that in the very beginning of your uh, of your of your early stage experience? Oh, I think um, well, I think everything sort of a default fail. <laughs> so I would say that there's a lot of ways that you can trip up. Um, I would say one thing that I could say is probably, um, you know, to to avoid too much hesitation and too much analysis uh, early on. More often than not, like a decision is better than no decision. And um, I found that um, you know a lot of people can hesitate. And um, if you do hesitate for too long, you often you know you're effectively making a decision by not making a decision, um, or, or you're pushing towards an outcome um, by not making a decision. So. I think better to sort of, um, you know, make a decision than, than no decision. Amazing. Okay, last one for me. Has anybody ever put tweezing grey hairs as a task on Airtasker? Because that feel then it would come full circle, you know. I don't know. I don't know. But maybe I should put pulling grey hairs off as a <laughs> listing on on listings and, and offer that. Actually, I might I might um, just say here a bit. I'm going to give a bit of a spruik to my Airtasker listing, uh, which is that I offer to review um, startup pitch decks. Uh, mm -hmm. So you can uh, you can look me up on Airtasker. I'll share you the link, Bede, if you want to um, share it later. Um, yeah. But you can buy it. I charge 500 bucks though, so it's uh, it's not cheap. Um, but if you do want me to review your pitch deck, I'll I'll give you personal feedback for um, yeah. the listing. That is very that is very very cool. Okay, well you heard it here first, everybody. Um, we have been with uh, Tim Fung. He's the co-founder and CEO of Airtasia. Um, mate, thanks so much for giving us your time. That was very, very insightful and an enjoyable conversation. And now you're going to have uh, 48 requests to uh, review decks over this weekend. So <laughs> I'll have that week.
Awesome. Thanks, Pete. I appreciate it. Thanks, mate. See you later. See you later.